Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is the Apostate uh, Prophet. How is everybody doing? I just decided uh, last minute to go live. Um, so there, there's a little bit of a delay in delivering it. And I know people complain like, oh, I didn't catch you live. I didn't. I wasn't informed about this and all of that. But everyone will see it later. So um, anyway, I am live today with um, a friend that I have been in touch with for quite a while actually, and uh, that I'm glad to finally have here um, on the channel to talk, to talk about very important things going on in the world. Uh, his channel is known as Israel Advocacy Movement. I shared some of his uh, work before, which I found very uh, interesting, very uh, enlightening about the conflict. Um, his actual name is some would say Joseph or just Yosef. How are you doing, Yosef? Baruch Hashem, Alhamdulillah. Thank God, I'm very good. Shalom Aleichem, as we say in the tradition. Uh, aleichem Shalom. Yeah. I just I just learned that it's basically the same as in, in Arabic, the response to it, which is Aleichem Salam, Aleichem Shalom. Easy, yeah. easy. We uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so my first question to you uh, would be, why are you planting garbage trees all the time? What is the deal with that? <laughs> well, you see, there's a very famous hadith, uh, <laughs> which is quoted quite often in Khan Yunus. Um, no, truth be told, we're, we're not planting any trees. We're, we're planting actually maybe the few atrogium uh, of uh, Renet um, to Jewish. Um, be aware of the audience. Yes, no, we're not planting trees. We're not gardeners. We're Jews. Awesome. Uh, it, it's very, um, lots of people who know my channel, who know what, about what I do, probably know this. Others might not be entirely familiar with this. Uh, but um, there is this entire myth this crazy idea um and i was told the very same thing I, I grew up in a very religious muslim household in a very islamic household and um so many times i was actually told that there will be a time in the future maybe when i'm all grown up that uh that we will fight the jews and we will kill them wherever we find them and they will hide behind rocks and trees and even the rocks and trees will say there is a jew behind me come and kill him except for one tree which is the karakat tree and because that tree is the tree of the jews and that tree will not tell and i would then hear in uh among you know in religious gatherings and uh you know others uh family friends like i remember an instance of sitting down and, and talking about how things will soon go bad, probably. And the Jews, they know very well what's going to happen. And they know very well that we will, uh, you know, go out and kill them, which is why they are secretly planting garbage trees. And I heard that stuff. And, and it's like, later, I realized that it was it wasn't just my family. I saw this idea this whole conspiracy theory that Israelis or Jews are planting garbage trees left and right everywhere. And funnily enough, when Jews are asked about it, they usually don't know what's what's happening and what they're talking about. <laughs> so. I, I actually um, photographed a sign at an anti-Israel demonstration in the UK not so a couple of weeks ago, and it shows how out of depth the police are in this country when it comes with dealing with fundamentalism. And there was a woman, she was the sweetest looking woman you could imagine, lovely smile, she was wearing hijab, um, look, look pure and innocent and she's holding a sign that said now you know why the trees and the rocks need to talk <laughs> she's walking past police no idea what it means no idea this is literally a genocidal um call for the, the murder of jews but anyway diverging but yeah um, yeah um and the thing is when we talk about this it is not just some crazy idea that some people hold that is actually something that is quite um essential to the war that is going on right now and the conflict um, as a larger conflict, right? Because um, this quote is not just something that uh, some crazy people believe in. It is something that is uh, that is found in the very original uh, covenant, the charter of Hamas that is currently at war with Israel that has committed the acts, uh, the atrocities on October 7. And what, what do you think about the fact that you are dealing with such an organization that has such a brutal hate uh, that that preached killing Jews, massacring Jews for 
decades now, but people around the world are still making ex excuses for them. What is your whole? It's not that opinion? they're making. Yeah, it's not that they're making excuses. They're completely deluded. I remember Jeremy Corbyn famously stating that Hamas are champions of social justice. I let let that let that sink in. Hamas. So Hamas. It doesn't matter where you. So I'm I'm probably quite different from most of the people that um or a lot of the people that potentially engage with your content i've spent the last 10 years building bridges with muslims i actually have positive like i'm i'm not in the battle against islam i'm in the battle against islamists and fundamentalism and so whenever i'm engaging with um muslims and non-muslims that defend hamas i point out a very basic teaching within islam anybody at a time of war that kills women and children anyone that even chops down a tree has removed themselves from islam like in islam you are not allowed to according to most traditions you're not allowed to do this now look at the hamas on the 7th of october there there was a ceasefire in place and on our eid on our festival on simchat torah which is a beautiful moment where the jews celebrate in the most joyous ways where uh, the, the the torah um that we were given and on that morning they broke into israel and they massacred massacred 1200 people i visited the sites of this massacre um two weeks after it occurred i visited sterot kisafim the gaza envelope i stepped into the houses and looked at the blood on the walls i you could smell and taste death everywhere it was one of the most harrowing experiences that i will take to my grave and to think that there are champions of social justice that describe these butchers who murdered women children babies the kidnapped innocent children holocaust survivors and hid them underground in tunnels for over a month to describe these monsters these rapists to describe these people as champions of social justice is an inversion and a perversion of the truth and it, it, it there is not a jew and truthfully not many non-jews that i know that are not appalled to see so many people marching in solidarity with these monsters. I visited an anti-Israel protest a couple of weeks ago, and I asked dozens of people, Hamas, are they terrorists or are they resistance? And the overwhelming majority of people said resistance. This is not resistance. This is barbarism. This is savagery. This is murder. Oh, I think you're on sorry, mute. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Do you think that people are genuinely, um, people are genuinely, they they know what Hamas stands for and what they believe in and what they do, and they still consider them to be uh, a resistance movement? Or do you think that uh, lots of these people are unaware of what Hamas actually is, uh, what their beliefs are, um, what their strategies are, the fact that they uh, did have the the, the explicit instruction and goal to go out and kill uh, as many civilians as possible, that they have these genocidal ideas. So, so do you think people are just, uh, you know, making excuses because they are ignorant? Or do you think people are actually justifying their horrendous ideas and the organization that Hamas is? I think it splits 50, oh, I don't know, 50-50, but there's definitely a divide. There are many people who they project their values onto Hamas. The, the greatest example would be queers for, for Palestine. Um, it would be, we don't have, there's no trans liberation without um, um, Palestinian liberation. The, these, and these people are willfully deluded. They, they pick up the Quran, they read the Hadith, and they project into these books their own values. They look at Hamas and they project onto these people their values. And yes, yeah, so they're completely deluded. They would not last two seconds in Gaza. They would not last two seconds in the moderate West Bank.
They would and there's also in Israel. They would last in Israel. Yeah. <laughs> They, they would last in Israel, um, which is, which brings a good question to mind that I'm going to uh, come to in a, in, a, in a second or in a minute, or whatever it is. But um, there is a lot of misinformation going around and uh, a, a lot of willful ignorance, a lot of delusion, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. Um, one of those issues is also, aside from making excuses for a uh, nice cup, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it's Ali Dawa's tears this week. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from making excuses for Hamas, there's also this uh, incredible insanity going on that makes me genuinely mad. You probably see I have been uh, you know, tweeting and sharing a lot about this, uh, a lot about the conflict uh, since October 7. But um, when we when we clearly show the atrocities that Hamas has committed, that were caught on camera, that Hamas terrorists themselves uh, recorded through their GoPros and all of that, of them um, stopping civilians and uh, executing them on the spot, going uh, shooting into homes, going into homes, setting them on fire, uh, leaving dead people of all ages, young adults, children, babies, elderly behind, burning people. All of these things, when we show this uh, to the public, there are so many people, there is an insanely disturbing amount of people who deny that this happened, who say, no, Hamas didn't do this. Israel actually did this to, the, to their own civilians. No, there is no evidence. Even if, if I put out a video in which you can see Hamas attacking uh, the kibbutz and uh, opening fire at a random civilian car and shooting everyone inside before proceeding, um, they will still deny this i'm sure you have seen that they will still come up with all kinds of different theories instead of just commenting on what's clearly seen in front of our eyes yeah so we i i believe we live in an age which is post-truth the truth does not matter anymore what matters is your tribal affiliation i was in a debate with adnan rashid on sunday and it was disgusting he demanded that I show him the beheaded babies. And so here is a man who wants to exploit and use my, my, my people's death, our dead, in a debate. So I, because we're in a debate, I took out my phone. I pulled up three different examples, one beheaded soldier, two beheaded. I'm, I'm not sure of the age, but the miners where their, their skulls had been burned but their heads were clearly no longer attached to their bodies. And he looked at me and said, where did you get these? And I said, the Israeli government. And he said, well, I don't accept that, that proof. So here is a man who demands proof. He's shown proof. The proof comes from the only people that could collect that proof, the IDF. And then he rejects it because it was never about the truth. It's just about making his side look good. Owen Jones was another person. Here he put out a video a couple of days ago. He saw the press screen. I also saw the press screening. What I saw on that video, I will again, I will take to my grave. It's a lot of the stuff that you were describing, which is in the public domain, but they have so much more footage that instead of it just being a 15 second clip which is very jarring but there's no context there's 138 of the, the the victims their murders are documented and it takes you on a journey owen jones the vile rabid anti-semite that he is and i'm saying this owen sue me if you're not an anti-semite take me to court owen jones the vile anti-semite demands that he not demands said he can't believe or didn't say he challenged the 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 claim that israeli women had been raped because he hadn't seen it in the video so think about, like, he here is a man a disgusting man demanding to see a woman raped so that he believes the claim now he takes every single statistic that the hamas ministry of health Publish. If they say 5,000 are dead, 
Owen Jones repeats 5,000 are dead. They say 15,000 are dead. The people, the savages, the brutes that carried out these massacres, he believes it without question. But if an Israeli woman claims that she was raped, and there is ample footage to support this, he rejects it. Why? Not because he doesn't believe it, not because it isn't true, but because it does not support his tribe. So we are in a world of post-truth where the truth does not matter. They could witness it with their own eyes and they would convince themselves what they were seeing was not happening. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so when, it, when it comes to the issue of, of rape, I can think of several um, pieces of evidence that uh, if anyone else presented those pieces of evidence, people would believe it and would, uh, would, would say it happened or it most likely happened. Uh, Owen Jones, for example, would probably, if it came from a celebrity in Hollywood, he would say, well, yeah. You know, deserves to be heard uh but when it comes from from israel it is apparently completely um discarded and disregarded but several pieces of evidence um i can think of first of witness accounts survivors many of them have said that uh that their friends or others other civilians were raped on the spot or in other places by Hamas terrorists. So that that is one account. But of course, uh, you're going to say, I don't believe Jews. You're going to say, I don't believe Israelis. I don't believe uh, anyone who is uh, a part of Israel. Fine, okay, whatever. Uh, second number of evidence is that we actually have videos, um, several of them, and I'm going to show some of them tomorrow, um, where, <laughs> In one video, a Hamas Hamas members drag out Israeli citizens and put them on the back of a pickup truck, and um, they are bringing out a woman. Uh, where, and, and the Hamas terrorist who's filming then uh, turns toward them and says, uh, "says uh, la la sabia," which is which means uh, no no no. That's a that's a concubine. That's a concubine. It's a, and then they are like okay, and then they they turn around and they bring her back inside. So. It's it, it. The context there is very clear. You could say that uh, that word might just be, uh, you know, female captive, but historically it was known as concubine. And just from the fact that they then turn around and take her back inside, it's evident that uh, what is what is being implied there is that that she is supposed to be used for sex by the Hamas terrorists. You have that evidence. You have another piece of evidence of. Um, I think these were even civilians from Gaza coming into uh, into Israel, taking a uh, Jewish girl with them, and then uh, filming it and uh, humiliating her and saying, "Oh, look, this is the dog of the of the Jews. Uh, she's she's our concubine," while she's uh, you know she has blood on her face and all of that. And then you have the rescue teams say that uh, most definitely rape occurred. We have uh, seen um the, the evidence of it we we encountered it we have it all then you have images of one of the women who were taken captive uh where, where you could clearly see blood on her back and all of that but despite all of this there are still people who will say well i didn't see a video of a hamas terrorist raping somebody directly on camera which is why i don't believe it which is an absurd thing to ask for because um a Hamas terrorist, an Islamist, would film himself beheading a child, but he wouldn't film himself raping somebody. But that doesn't mean it didn't occur. In the the, the press screening, um, there's some harrowing, harrowing footage where you can see that one of the, the victims that have been murdered is clearly missing her underwear. Um, now, that doesn't just fall off by chance. There's testimony of women who witnessed other another woman being raped and then shot during in the head during the act um or during the attack sorry and we have this the whole me too movement believe women and it just seems like yeah me too unless you're a jew and then there's no me too for you it's it's it really is disgusting and it shows up progressives around the world who espouse these values when they're navel gazing on common college campuses but then when it happens to jewish people 
in the biggest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, we don't believe women, not those women. They're the wrong type of women. Did you um, did you ever expect something like this to happen? Did you ever think it could happen in any you know in, in our time? Something like the, the the massive attack on October seven, which was even in their own words a massacre of Jews. I think the 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 best response I can give to that is actually what happened to me in synagogue the following Sabbath. So the rabbi out of the blue said, we're going to insert a prayer, and it's called Avarachamim. We're going to insert a prayer, which is a prayer that we say for massacred Jewish communities. Let that sink in. The Jewish people have been persecuted so much that we have a prayer, not for the massacred people, individuals, but the entire communities that were massacred. And that Saturday, we recited that prayer. And whenever I've said that prayer before, because we say it before certain holidays to remember those that were slaughtered centuries ago, it was written in the 11th, um, the 1100s. And I've always imagined crusaders and Jews and villagers. And I, it was a distant, distant thing. It was, it was in the past. It wasn't, it wasn't real. It wasn't my community. It was the old Jews. This time when I said it, I looked out the window and I could see my, my daughter, I've got a young daughter, scooting down a hill. And I was looking at her and then flashing through my, my mind was the, the horrendous videos and images that you've just been describing of dead Israelis. And it suddenly, it struck me that this, this prayer is usually, historically, it's been said by Jews like me and they're not thinking about centuries ago. They're thinking about the massacres that they've experienced, they've witnessed in their lifetime. When we lived in the Muslim world, we were slaughtered. When we lived in Christendom, we were slaughtered. In the 20th century, we were slaughtered. And this was the first time in my lifetime that I witnessed such a brutal and horrific massacre. And so, yes, I wasn't expecting that. As I said, historically, I wasn't relating to this prayer in, in the way that I did that on that Saturday. Um, so, yeah, um, I wasn't expecting this. I don't think many of us could have imagined such um, a barbaric act being carried out against our friends and family in the south of Israel. It was, it was uh, shocking. Um, I remember I was... Uh... I was just about to go to sleep when I saw the, the news of it happening because I'm on the other side of the world and it was night here. Um, but it, the, 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 the insane thing to me is when those massacres happened on October 7, when the world could see what, these, what the terrorists are doing, pouring into Israel and indiscriminately targeting uh, civilians, killing them left and right, I thought... I don't know. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I didn't have great judgment on the issue. But I thought, okay, you know, after this, after what is happening today in front of the whole world, the narrative must change. It must change. People won't just, uh, you know, uh, make excuses or you know, uh, listen to the whole victim playing by uh, by Hamas and and the others. No, this time they will see it because we are seeing it right now. It's happening in front of our eyes. This time things will change. The victim playing will not work anymore but i was completely wrong because they started as soon as israel responded they started complaining and victim playing and now it seems like lots of people around the world completely forgot what happened on october 7th and they are just uh they, they are buying into it and they are ignoring the suffering that uh was caused on that day and uh, do you want to know the truly sad part about all of this? This is the most positive reception we've received <laughs> from the international community. Um, so there, there is, um, there, there are people that have recognized the magnitude of the massacre. And we, we, we told ourselves, we're going to have a week of sympathy and then the world's going to turn on us. Um, and that's what's happened. Uh, sadly, we 
it wasn't uh, the, the 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 attack took place on a Jewish festival. I wasn't able to even fully understand the the magnitude of what had happened until two days later, because the Jewish festival lasts for two days and we can't use electricity. So we were going out and check it. The security guard was giving us updates because he's not Jewish and he can go on his phone. Um, but none of us really knew uh, the magnitude. But the following day, I attended a pro Palestinian, what I would describe as a pro Hamas, anti anti Israel celebration on the streets of London. Thousands of people jubilant at the attack. Two days after the massacre, there had been no response from Israel at this point. No response. And thousands of people were celebrating. And the hundreds of thousands of people you saw marching against Israel over the last few weeks in the UK. Had Hamas killed more Jews, those people, or many of those people, would be marching in celebration. This, these marches, these people, their end goal, make no mistake, is the destruction of Israel. They chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And on the 7th of October, they showed us exactly what they mean by free. They mean free of Jews. And they mean free of Jews in the most brutal ways you can imagine. That is uh, unfortunately true. I think of one video that I saw um, when um, after the the events happened after October seven, uh, which I quickly want to uh, pull up here and, and show actually, because it is such a clear display of how people who are on the pro Hamas side were acting when the attack happened. The same people who are now complaining and crying and talking about human lives were celebrating. Here's one of those examples. Live from Greenacre. Weaving through traffic on Waterloo Road with Palestinian flags waving. Oh A rallying cry echoing from Greenacre to Lakemba. There, a crowd hundred strong gathered in response to attacks half a world away. Islamic leaders address the crowd. I'm smiling and I'm happy. I'm elated. It's a day of courage. The Sheikh's comments this morning left Jewish leaders distressed. Now, uh, this is this is. It's 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 crazy. It is uh, it is really messed up, but it's also stupid because um, I mean, as soon as that happened, as soon as the attack happened, uh, I knew that this is a that that this is an incredibly stupid act. This is a uh, a suicidal act by Hamas because their attack, as glorious as it might seem to them, will only lead to a brutal response from Israel. But people like this guy apparently didn't see that coming. They apparently didn't, didn't count on the idea of responding to such massacres with severity. But yeah, people people did celebrate. They, they celebrated. They saw this, um, the, the massacres of civilians, of hundreds of them, uh, as something great it's something joyful as a, as a as a sign of hope it's insane uh, it's truly insane and for for jews like me it leaves us very uncomfortable about our future in western nations the fact that you can have mobs of people on the street celebrating the murder of jews and just for context there were no celebrations when Palestinians are killed in this conflict on Western streets. There were no videos coming out of Israel where Israelis are taking naked corpses back into Israel and crowds are forming and beating and spitting on this dead, raped woman. But this is exactly what happened to an Israeli or a German Israeli Jewish girl who was taken into Gaza, or her corpse was taken into Gaza. Crowds, this wasn't a Hamas rally, this was just Gazans, poured out from the streets and started beating and spitting on this poor, dead, 
girl. Now, there is a sickness here. Tragically, there is a cultural problem where the response to seeing a dead Jew, and it's not just a dead Jew. On Friday, you had crowds celebrating the murder of Palestinians who were accused of collaborating, public lynching, jubilation. There is a real problem here. Hopefully, the war will come to a speedy end. Hopefully, Hamas committed suicide on the 7th of October, as you, as you describe. But there is a decades-long decades, decades denazification program that needs to take place. For the last 17 years, the savages that carried out this attack have been in charge of the education of Gaza. Half of Gaza is under the age of 18 and have been indoctrinated into this dangerous creed. And there's a real need to deprogram and rebuild. And it's a very, very daunting challenge. I, I'm hopeful in the sense that there are certain moments in history where if you catch a wave, you can change the course of history. And the normalization of relations between Israel and many of the Gulf states could pave the way to a brighter and more positive um, Gaza and the West Bank. If instead of the Iranians who are encouraging war and encouraging attacks like these and encouraging terrorism like this, if instead we've got moderates like the Emiratis stepping in and building bridges and rebuilding Palestinian with with with, with Palestinians on the ground, hopefully that maybe there there could be hope, but there is a real cultural problem both there and sadly now here in the West where people celebrate the barbaric acts. Um, what do you think is the? I want to ask your thoughts because a lot of people, uh, you know, we we talk about how horrible everything has been, and. Um, Obviously, after October 7, um, Israel um, made it very clear that they are now declaring war. It is an official war. And um, Israel, not only Netanyahu, the government, uh, the Israeli defense minister uh, and others, they have expressed a very clear goal, which is to um, destroy and completely eradicate Hamas. And there will be no stopping until that goal is achieved because this is it. This can no longer be endured. Um, and as it seems, after the current ceasefire, things will go on and uh, will probably go to an even more brutal level. Now, lots of people talk about what the appropriate response should be. And I know that lots of people um, are just having these uh, very high expectations and very high standards for how Israel responds to things. They would never have the same expectations from any other country. But um, people say that the IDF's response in uh, bombing Gaza uh, are very disproportionate and you know, very out of proportion and too harsh. What do you think about all of that. What do you think the response, do you think the response is too much? Do you think it is just right? What do you think should be done in your opinion? So I think the first thing I'd start with is ask the audience to think of all the other wars that they can remember. ISIS and, um, I don't know, that's going to get you censored. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in okay. Syria, um, Iraq and America, Afghanistan, um, Central African Republic, Yemen, do you ever hear the word proportionality ever mentioned in any of these other conflicts? I don't. I can't remember this ever, ever been, uh, ever occurring. And now let's look at the actions as well. Can you think of another nation whose military drop flyers on a neighborhood where they know Hamas have fortified and built rocket launchers, underground bunkers, etc.? Drop leaflets saying in the coming days or weeks, there's going to be a military incursion. Can you remember reading on the BBC or any other news outlet that a military force would ring up the, the, the residents of a building and warn them that this building's about to get struck because Hamas have a, or an enemy has a base in it? I can't remember that happening. Can you remember any other military de developing something called a knock on the roof, a non-lethal explosion that occurs above a building? So there's a non-lethal explosion above the building. So the residents know if they haven't got the telephone call, if they haven't read the leaflet, that there's going to be a strike on the building. Then they do a flyover to make sure that there's no civilians. And only then, only then do they take out the Hamas base. 
Can you think of another military that does that? I can't. I can't think of any military that goes those lengths. Yet still they talk about proportionality. Do you know what proportionality would be? If Israel behaved in the same savage and barbaric way that Hamas did. Instead, we give Palestinians medical aid. Yihya Sinwa received medical aid when he was in Israeli prison. And he's the, sorry, he's the leader of the, the Palestinian military, uh, sorry, the Hamas military wing. He was given medical aid as almost every Hamas leader has received from Israelis. And yet they talk about proportionality. Thank God Israel is a Jewish state with Jewish values. Thank God. But the question of proportionality is absolutely absurd because it's not applied to any other nation. And Israel goes to greater lengths than any other nation before it or in our time to minimize civilian casualties. You know what's insane? Um, are two things about what you just said. There's just so much that, that this uh, that this reminds me of. But um, I saw people. Um, you mentioned that Israel uh, does the the warning blasts uh, to let them know that that that, that strikes are coming. Uh, I've seen people complain about that as an offense, as an atrocity, as an, an oppression, which is just insane to. To think, <laughs> it is it is it is a blast literally given so that you know so that you are forewarned. My, my favorite coming. one, which links into that, is Israel is ethnically cleansing the Palestinians from Gaza City. Israel's warning the Palestinians to leave that there's going to be a war zone. Would you rather they stayed like Hamas want them to and function as human shields? And, and the thing is also uh, they complain well. Um, Israel is telling them to evacuate the north, but there is also fighting and um, blasts happening in other places. I'm not sure if you can still hear me. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so Israel Israel warns that uh, civilians should evacuate the north because there will be heavy fighting and there will be an incursion. But but uh, things also happen to them on the way or in the south. Uh, but the issue is. What Israel is saying is not that there will be only fighting in the north and there will be only targeted attacks in the north. What they are saying is that the north will be the focus. The north will be what the where the heavy fighting, the incursion, and the most of the bombing will take place. If you go to the south, it will be safer for you relatively compared to the north. But people uh, complain about this and, and say, well, any, any place is going to be the same. If I go to the south, I might die too, so I might just stay here, which is an incredibly idiotic way to think. Why would you stay in a war zone where you are clearly told you are in significantly more danger? And I saw the words, and I can even pull it up here, uh, of, um, what's his name, Hagari, I, I believe. Uh, he, he says specifically, his wording is very clear, go to the south, it is a safer area, safer relative it is a safer area he's not saying go to the south it is you are you're going to be safe there he's saying go to the south you are going to be safer than in the north but apparently people are expecting a war to be like a video game or something where you know where if you don't want to participate you're going to maybe just go to this one place and you'll be completely fine no it's a war a war started by the government in charge of gaza and in a war things are going to be bad and you you best get out of the middle of the war zone with your children instead of leaving your children there, having them die, and then parading them and saying, look, they killed my child. <sighs> don't know if you want to add anything to that. But, um, and the, the other issue also, with which, which just reminds me of, is um, I, I read yesterday about this woman who is paraded, um, who is, who is shown, whose face is shown, her face was half burned because uh, of an attack where she um, reportedly, to which she also confessed, by the way, reportedly was carrying a gas tank in her vehicle, which she um, attempted to ignite to blow up and kill a police officer and herself. Her name is uh, Isra Jarbis, and um, her face was burned. The face of the, the police officer was also burned. She went to prison where she actually received treatment and help from Israel but she complained because she didn't get the full uh you know cosmetic surgeries and all of the, those things that she asked for 
and people are saying it's not enough. They should have helped. They should have helped her get all the surgeries, despite the fact that Israel saved her life, treated her, gave her multiple surgeries, and so on. This is the the insanity that we're dealing with. Yeah, there's many many instances like that. One of this is not a game, but one of the games I play is every time I see an anti-Israel um, influencer posting a picture of one of the innocent prisoners that have been released. I just Google what was the crime? Because like without fail, every single one they post, whether it's Gigi Hadid and the, the 13 year old who, well, who was jailed when he was 13 for stabbing Israelis with his cousin. And you can literally, I remember watching the video at the time where the, the two of them are running around with knives looking for Israelis and stabbing them when they found them. And so the, 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 the insanity is the world will say, how can Israel lock up children? It's like, any nation knocks up locks up children that stab children and adults. It's like it's standard protocol. If somebody murders, they get arrested and locked up and detained. And it's just a, it, it's this pantomime where reality doesn't matter, truth doesn't matter. What matters is can I find any way of twisting this story to make the Jewish state look bad? And that's what happens. So whether it's someone trying to blow up a Israeli police officer. Um, burning seriously burning themselves and then not being able to get the cosmetic surgery that she wants after her life has been saved by the health um, system that's then twisted into not israel saves suicide bomber but israel refuses to give health care to innocent palestinian woman yeah th so this is the incident we're talking about this woman is uh isra jabis she was just released um from israeli uh, prison in the whole exchange program and um her face was shown so much in um on the pro-palestine media on social media and all of that and, and uh it was shown to people like look how they treated her look how they neglected her the the backstory of it is that she actually planned on uh on on killing herself and israelis or israeli officers inside a car she just did a horrible job she tried to ignite a a, a gas tank in her car no no, no idea who, where she got that stupid idea from uh, and she burned herself in the attempt and also burned the police officers face and chest and nowhere you can find photos of the police officer i had to I mean, you you have to really look for it and enter his name to find photos of him when he is the actual victim here. But you will find photos of her like, poor thing, look what happened to her. Look how, how Israel uh, mistreated and neglected her. She is the one who did this to herself. And she was saved by him and by others, despite the fact that she tried to kill him and others. This is just insane to me. I, the 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 expectations, the standards, the morality these people impose in this in this conflict, it's beyond insane. Although it shouldn't surprise me because I I grew up with this. I grew up uh, hating Jews, believing that they are all evil, believing that the Palestinians are completely right and they deserve everything and all of that. But still, I'm surprised every day by the by the standards I'm confronted with here. I, I think that the issue is, is, as you described, it's so endemic, it's so pervasive. I, I remember looking up, it's always a difficulty when you're looking up the the, um, the prisoners that have been released because their names are transliterated from Arabic into Hebrew and then into English of, um, back into Arabic. And so it can be a little difficult piecing them together. I remember stumbling across like one woman, where I'm at, Walla um, Fawzi Tanji. And she was a Palestinian who had her own documentary. They had a whole documentary about her called uh, something to do with Walla. What's Walla? What's bothering Walla? Something like that. And she had her own documentary. And then a few years later, she joined a terror cell. Three women. They wanted to avenge um, the leader of the Lion's Den who'd been killed um, by the, the IDF. They wanted to avenge his death. They, they got a gun. They went looking for Jews and they were intercepted. But this is... The, this hatred of Jews is so endemic that documentary stars are then going on to go on killing sprees to murder as many Jews as they can. And then the world will turn around and say, Israel incarcerates documentary um, star. It, it's, it's, yeah, we're, we're in the twilight zone. Um, yeah. 
Chris at Speaker's Corner says, good to see Joseph from the corner with AP. God bless you both. Thank you so much. God Thank bless you too, Chris. It's good to see you. Well, good to see you. We're... You are often at Speaker's Corner, right? Uh... Yeah, actually, to that point, something which we should definitely say, if you haven't already said that on previous shows, is Hatun Tash has gone oh. missing. Um, she's been missing for two weeks. So Hatun Tash is a prominent ex-Muslim, as I don't need to tell anyone in your audience. A very courageous woman. I don't always, I rarely agree with her message, but I absolutely defend her right to say whatever she wants at Speaker's Corner. And it's absolutely terrifying that she's gone missing and we're all praying and hoping for her safe return. Um, it, it, I, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. You finish your thought. No, I, I was just going to say, it's um, all of us that do what we do, and whether it's a Zionist like myself, an ex-Muslim, a ex-Muslim Christian preacher, there's a target on all of our backs. And we often pretend to ourselves that this isn't real. And Hatun Tash has a bigger target than anyone I know and is one of the most courageous people I've ever met. As I said, I fundamentally disagree with a lot of what she says, but she has every right to say it. And it's a very, very, very concerning and scary thought that she has gone missing and please god um she we, we, we see her soon yeah I, I met her recently in person and uh noticed that she's a very a very kind person uh very reasonable person and a very brave person at the same time it's 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 i don't know um for some reason me as an ex-muslim atheist uh her as an ex-Muslim Christian who was very devout and you know very has a very religious mindset, I thought uh, I, I don't know why, but I kind of had had different expectations. But she was like, as soon as she saw me, she was like, "Hey, come here, come here, let's talk." And <laughs> she just talked to me and uh, you know, joked with me and all of that for 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 very very long. And um, it was very nice to spend time with her. But yeah, I, I recently just learned that she has been missing. So for those who uh, missed it, Hadantash has been missing. Nobody heard anything from her uh, for two weeks now. Um, the the reason that I didn't uh, bring this to the public, the reason that I didn't talk about it, is I talked to David about this. I asked him uh, what's what's going on to David Wood, and um, he said uh, it's true we haven't heard anything from her, but this would not be the first time that she disappeared, because uh, several times in the past she did um, just you know go off without telling anyone and would just uh, in his words uh, preach the gospel to people uh, because she just thinks she has a calling and then she would she would be back. So we don't exactly know what's happening. Um, but she could be targeted or it could just be that we have to know more about this so i'm, I'm kind of waiting for more information on this stuff I, i'm hoping it's the latter and i'm actually very impressed to hear that you actually had a conversation with hutton because she's always so lovely to me but we can't get three seconds without her preaching the gospel and trying to take <laughs> 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 Sweet woman. she did try to uh <laughs> She did try to make a few a few jokes and a few digs here and there. Whenever I I talk to her, she's like, "Well, it's because you don't know Jesus." And I'm like, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> she is she is nice. She is nice. I, yeah. I hope she's safe. As an Orthodox Jew, it's a very unusual thing for me to say, but I pray that she's just man preaching the gospel. <laughs> 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 so yeah, um, I hope you're right. As, as an a, atheist, I I hope too that she's just preaching the gospel here. So. <laughs> Um, I, and I hope we find out about the good news, no pun intended, very soon. Um, yeah, back to the conflict. Um, how does this whole situation impact you? Like you are in the UK. I recently look, looked up statistics in the UK, specifically hate crimes in the UK. And um, the, uh, <clears throat> according to 2022 numbers of hate crimes, uh, despite the very small amount of Jews in the UK, um, Jews are this, now the, the, the second most targeted group, but they are but they are per person seven times more likely to be targeted in hate crimes than Muslims. So, um, which which is which is crazy. And I know that since October seven, and since the war 
uh, between Israel and Hamas, things got really bad. And uh, there are anti-Semitic anti-Semitic attacks left and right in the world. And UK is one of the hotspots here. How is the situation there? So it's it's very concerning. Truthfully, there's been a 1500% rise in anti-Semitic attacks. Now, why that's important is I'm wearing a, a, a kippah, a yarmulke, a couple. It's got many different names. And I'm visibly Jewish. The overwhelming majority of Jews in the UK are not Orthodox, and they're not visibly Jewish. So you have an invisible community that has still been subject to a 1,500% rise in anti-Semitic attacks. They are proportionately the most likely, we are the most proportionate, um, likely to be attacked in all of the UK of any minority, any minority community. Everyone has an opinion of us. They think we're huge. There's a quarter of a million of us here. Orthodox, a tiny fraction of that. And yet the UK has 60 million people. There's only 15 million Jews in the world. One five, not five zero. 15 million Jews in the world. And half of them are in Israel. Yet we are the most... Uh, um, attacked in almost every nation we live. I'm sure you saw the scenes from Dagestan where Jews were hunted in an airport. There were scenes in London where they got wind at a protest outside, outside Downing Street that there was a Zionist present. They went crazy. The mob went searching for Jews. I myself was chased down the street by an angry, screaming mob who were chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, at me. The police were so concerned, they came between me. They said, you have to hide in this restaurant. The police pushed me into a restaurant as the mob and the crowd grew. As they heard that there was a Jew in the restaurant, more and more from the crowd came to scream at the Jew in the restaurant. There was a wall of police between me and this screaming mob that were baying for my blood. And inside the restaurant, a woman, a pro-Palestinian, an anti-Israel protester, was having a, a, a meal with her, her, pair, her mother. And she came up to me and she said, oh, this is two days after the massacre. Oh, your people dead? Good, good. Oh, your people dying? Good. This is what we face in the UK. Jews are not safe here. It's, it's hard to believe that the nation that prides itself on liberalism, diversity, multiculturalism, there's one community that feels very unwelcomed. And it's actually one of the oldest communities that have lived here as a minority. And there is not a Jew I know that isn't discussing the future of us in this country. We were just recently polled and 50% of the community said they're considering leaving the UK. Let that sink in. This is a very old, centuries old Jewish community and half of us are now questioning, questioning whether we have a future in the UK myself and my family included. Yeah, uh, here is a graph that I quickly want to um, want to show here. Uh, so I, I recently looked at this, uh, according to Statista uh, 2021 numbers, uh, hate crimes by religion of victim in the UK, so in England and Wales, actually, um, it says 3,459 were Muslims, Jews were 1,919. Now you could say, oh, look, biggest victims of hate crimes are Muslims. But uh, one thing that seems to be missing here is Muslim population in the UK is around 4 million by now. It's 3.9 million. The population of Jews in England is in England and Wales is around uh, 270,000 or something like that, right? So comparably very, very small. And yet... The amount of Jews, uh, you know, being victims in hate crimes is more than 50% of the number of Muslim, Muslim victims, which is disproportionate. By, by these numbers, a Jew is seven times more likely to be targeted than a, than a Muslim, uh, which in the UK. And this only just increased this year after October 7th. Now, just to add just what I was saying before, Muslims um, are far more visible than Jews as well. So not only are they more numerous, they are more visible than, than, a, um, than a religious Jew. And a non-religious Jew is almost invisible. Um, 
Now, historically, the Jewish people have depended, we have depended on rulers and militaries to come to our defense when we've been massacred. Thank God, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, the Jewish people have a state today because no longer do we need to go begging from country to country when tyrants rise up to massacre us. We have a military, we have a home, we have a place of rest, refuge. And so if things increase and continue on the trajectory that they are in in the West, we have a place of refuge that we can return to. We have Israel and we have a military that will defend us. Gone are the days where the Jew begs the international community to intervene, to respond when we're massacred. Today, when they massacre us, the international community begs us not to respond. Chalas, enough. If you rise up to kill us, we will strike back. And we now have a refuge. Uh, I mean, just um, the fact that Jews need a homeland here to defend themselves. You can see in the, in the example you just described, you are in the UK. You are, a, you are visibly Jewish. And you are attacked there in the UK, not because you are Israel. You are attacked in response to the Israel, uh, Israel Hamas war, simply because you are a Jew. It's not because you are from Israel. It is because you are a Jew. Synagogues around the world are attacked, vandalized, because they are part of the Jewish religion, the Jewish identity, not because they are in Israel or from Israel. So whenever something happens uh, and something Jewish is involved or Israel is involved, the targets are the Jews. It's not just Israel, it's the Jews. And it's very similar. It, it, this is the way it was in history. So um, there is one point, which is uh, Muslims often bring this idea, this claim, which I just know from my basic knowledge of the history is complete nonsense. But they will say Jews and Muslims lived in peace and Jews had it very well. Jews were completely safe and there was no need for a for a Jewish state and all of that in Muslim lands. Uh, what do you say about that? Um, never again. <laughs> so, so no, it's, it, it, you, it's the, you know the absurdity of this thing. If you ask those same people that claim that the Jews lived incredibly in every caliphate, under every khulafa, the Jews just had the perfect existence. You ask them, did the Muslims? They'll always say no. They, they, they were drunks. They persecuted the Muslims. They did this. They did that. Yet somehow these same caliphs were who, who were persecuting the Muslims were somehow completely um, molly. They, they, they just nurtured and cared, the, uh, looked after the Jews with such humanity that the, the Jews never wanted for anything. It's in, it's nonsense. Um, if you want to understand how Jews were treated under the different caliphates, read from the Jews who lived in those caliphates. I've got entire bookshelves um, filled with writings from um, Genezas, from rabbis, from various places of what it was like to live under Islam. And if I'm truthful, which I believe is important, there were definitely caliphates where Jews flourished and did very well. But there were other caliphates where we were put to the sword, where we were persecuted where like taxes that you could not believe were levied on the jewish community that impoverished us there were regular appeals actually interesting for your christian audience which i know you have a large one it was often the christians in europe at the back end of the um, 20th century and 19th century no the back end of the 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 the, the, the um the, the 1800s that it was the christians of europe that would often send arms and money charity to the persecuted Jewish communities in places like Israel and uh, in Jerusalem. So it's just, it, 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 it's a lie. It's a lie and they know it's a lie. Um, I mean, just to think about the previous century before the state of Israel was established, uh, you could say um, modern Zionism developed uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, was shaped at the beginning of the, uh, the, the 20th century. Um, but they will claim that Jews until that point were completely fine in Muslim lands. But uh, the, the 19th century, 
was already a very bloody one. In fact, um, one of the events, and this is this is not very much known apparently, but one of the events that actually contributed to the idea of uh, of the need for a Jewish home was uh, the Damascus affair in. Uh, was it the 1840s? Was it 1840s? Something like that, I, be I believe, where um, a, a pogrom, an attack on Jews took place in Damascus, which is not very far from uh, what they consider Palestine, where, um, where, where somebody was, where, some, where a, a Christian man and his Muslim servant went missing, um, and then some bones were found in... <laughs> In a Jewish neighborhood, nobody could confirm that these are human bones. In fact, authorities refuse to say that these are human bones. But um, certain people in charge made the claim, look, these are bones belonging to those people who went missing. The Jews killed them. And then a whole campaign of blood libel started. This whole a ancient idea, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that uh, Jews killed these uh, non-Jewish people to use their blood to, uh, you know, to, to bake uh, in their in their holy uh, evil rituals. They killed those people, which is why we have to drive the Jews out and kill their kids and all of that. So this campaign started in the 1840s. And it was a it was a massive one, and it, it sent shockwaves around the world. But apparently, if you ask uh, Muslims today, no, everything was completely fine. None of that actually happened. Just following on from that, one of the the, the, the most insane things that get said in these circles is that it wasn't the Palestinians that murdered the Jews in Europe. The Palestinians opened up their houses to the Jews, and you stole their house. Now. <laughs> Anybody who is even slightly historically literate will know that the Arabs over were like certainly the Palestinians and the Iraqis were hugely inspired by the Nazi ideology. In fact, Hajimin al Husseini, who was the leader of the Palestinian during the, 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 the mid century period, he was a massive Nazi collaborator. He was one of the highest paid Nazi officials in Germany, in Berlin, where he stayed during the war. He was he tried to re recruit Albanians and Bosnians to form death squads to kill Jews. These were the Palestinian. This was the Palestinian leadership. The Palestinians did not open up their homes to the Jews who were being slaughtered in the Holocaust. The Palestinians fought with the Holocaust survivors who'd been welcomed into the homes of the Jews who were always living in the land. So another thing, people think that the Jews recently came to Israel. The Jews never left Israel. Some of our greatest books were written over the last 2,000 years from Israel. Um, the the um, Jerusalem Talmud is one of the most important books in the Jewish canon. It was written in the land of Israel. The, the, Shulchan, the Shulchan Aruch, which is a book of Jewish law, its author lived in Israel, Yosef Cairo, Rabbi Yosef Cairo. I, we never left the land. In 1844, Jews had the majority population of Jerusalem. There were 4,000 Christians, 4,000 Muslims, and 8,000 Jews. The Palestinians did not open up their houses to the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. The Jews opened up their houses, and the Palestinians tried to kill them. Uh, one thing also to mention here, which is um, very relevant, the, the Arabs who are called Palestinians didn't even have the authority to open their doors to, to Jews because they are they were not in charge of the land. They, the, rule, the land was not ruled by them at no, at no point, by the way, over the last centuries. It was under Ottoman rule. It was imperial Ottoman land, and it was taken by Great Britain from the Ottoman Empire and ruled by them as the mandate for Palestine or mandatory Palestine. So um, the, the Arabs were never in charge of deciding who comes into this place and leaves that place. It was the British who were in charge and appointed Jewish authorities who were in charge, who also issued uh, immigration papers to people who would come and go. So that whole narrative completely, um, it doesn't even begin to be historically accurate. It gets even better during the Holocaust, 1939, 
the British issued the white paper, which limited Jewish immigration to the land. Meanwhile, Arabs were flocking in, attracted to the economic conditions that the Zionists and the British created in British Mandatory Palestine. Everything that most people have heard about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in its history is a lie. There was never a country called Palestine. There was no Palestinian king. There was no Palestinian language. There was no Palestinian culture. Here's a challenge to anyone in the chat. Show me... Uh, a culture which is unique to the people of Palestine. Show me Palestinian culture. Challenge, it's there. I'm sure there's a, one or two <laughs> of your um, friends in the chat um, that will happily rise to the challenge. So it's on. Someone Google and find me some Palestinian culture. I that will. Count. I will let. I will let a Hamas official speak um, for themselves to prove to you that. <laughs> to prove to you prove to you something uh, here about where Palestinians came from the Hamas leader had some very harsh words about about this stuff Hamas uh, of senior official so this is uh Fatih Hamad who is a Hamas senior official who is also in charge of al-Aqsa TV which is the primary propaganda channel in Gaza also broadcast in in the West Bank were also some really interesting things like Farfour which is a cartoon which is a a, a mickey mouse like character that advocates for the killing of jews it takes place under his watch but he had some very interesting words about who Palestine, palestinians are and i would just let him speak here <laughs> He says, brothers, half the Palestinians are Egyptians, the other half are Saudis. So yeah, uh, here you have uh, Fatih Hamad, who is responsible for propaganda in the name of Hamas, going on TV and crying out to the Arab world, asking for more support and saying, don't you see, we are the same. We are Arabs. We come from Egypt, Saudi Arabia, from, I don't know, Yemen, Jordan, here and there. We are Arabs. We come from all around the world. That's what he's saying. But uh, if I said this stuff, I would be accused of being, you know, uh just you know be, being a zionist propaganda shill or <laughs> whatever it is but he says it right here the guy from hamas <laughs> yeah it gets even better like i encourage anybody whenever you see a palestinian on the news google their, their surname so muhammad el kurd one of the most famous Palestinian activists. Where do you think he's from? Al Kurd, um, Al Masri, as we just said, Al Saud, Al, Mag Al Saud of Saudi Arabia, Al Maghrebi, um, the like Mag the Maghreb is like Morocco, Algeria, that sort of region. The names hint to where they came from. Even the big families like the Nashashibis and the Husseinis, we know when they came into the land. We like we can trace all of these the, the various people. Now that's not to say that there weren't Palestinians or Arabs that were living in the land. There were. There were people who converted from Christianity to Islam, from Judaism to Islam. But the majority of Arabs are not those people. The majority came much more recently. In 1882, there were 270,000 Muslim Arabs in the land. By 1946, that had swelled. So 1945, sorry, that had swelled to 1.26 million. It was the biggest population explosion in the Middle East. Um, and it was because they were attracted, as we said before, by the economic conditions. The So yeah, Google the names of the Palestinians when you see them on the television, and you'll be able to find if they are in, truly indigenous or if they are Johnny-come-latelys. Johnny now, uh, from, from my research, the only people... I wouldn't say the that this is very. I really have to be careful how I how I word this. But um, now, to be very honest, I do not believe that genetics have any impact on on whether the land is yours or not. Um, it, it's it's much more complicated than that. But if you want to co go to the genetics and you want to argue that um, <clears throat> that Palestinians are, you know, um, it, the the indigenous people of the land 
and it therefore belongs to them because they were there forever. Uh, what the genetics actually reveal is that there, there is a certain part of Palestinians that, that are nowadays called Palestinians, um, which do have uh, genetics that are very much linked to ancient populations. And that part of Palestinians is, uh, they're not the Muslim Palestinians, they're actually the Christian Palestinians, those who did not convert to Islam, those who did not come with the with the Islamic invasion, those who did not, you know, who did not establish themselves in the region over the last uh, 1,400 years. There is um, the, the Palestinian Christians who identify as Palestinian Christians, um, they are much more linked to ancient civilizations than the Palestinian Muslims on average, because the Palestinian Muslims are often people who uh, descend from, uh, you know, Arab invasions or, you know, mixing with Arab populations. I mean, 15% of them, I think, have have sub-Saharan African uh, genetics from, uh, you know, either coming from there or taking slaves and uh, mating with them and all that. So, um this whole idea that Palestinians are a people that lived in this land forever and, and then are therefore indigenous is ahistorical, it's nonsensical. And besides the point, we know for a fact that Jews lived in the land forever. And yeah, and and and, and, the, and the, the, the Arab people that are nowadays known as Palestinians, they were not. They were not even known as Palestinians <laughs> prior to the twentieth century. Nobody called. They didn't call themselves Palestinians. If you if you had, if you built a time machine and you went to uh, eighteen hundred to 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 eighteen eighty and asked to the and spoke to the local people and say, "Hey, you are you guys are Palestinians, right?" They would have no idea what you're talking about because they just call themselves Arabs or Muslims or from here and there. I guess even better if you look at the nineteen thirty six Pale Commission. There's a very famous Arab leader called Awni Bey Abd al-Hadi. And he tells the British straight, he looks them in the eye and said, there is no such country called Palestine. Palestine is a word the Zionists invented. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, um, no, the Palestinian national identity came much later and it was a reaction to, to Zionism, to the, the Israeli state. It's not there, there were truths. I think it's important to be historically accurate. There were Arabs that even established small kingdoms, and it's like you had the Nabataeans, and so you had transient communities um, that would pass in and out. But what remained constant was the Jews. The Jews were always, since the establishment of the, the early Jewish kingdoms, the Jews have always remained in the land, and we never left. Um, there have been expulsions. Jerusalem is an example where Jerusalem was emptied, but we never left. Just before the Arab conquest in 637 under Umar ibn al-Khattab, there are almost 400,000 Jews living in northern Israel. Um, and there has been definitely... I, m many people don't realize that Arabism or Islam um, is a colonial force. It colonizes and it replaces the indigenous cultures, and it has various mechanisms to do this. But this is why Islam has spread so so far and so wide. It spread at the sword and it spread through cultural colonialism. It is classical colonialism, so much so that the, 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 the resources were ripped out of the land, were taken from the people and sent as a tribute back to, to Medina or to wherever the, the capital of the caliphate was at that time. Um, so yeah, there, there were Arabs in the land, there were Christians in the land, there were pagans in the land and the Jews rarely converted, interestingly, to mm -hmm. Islam, but most of the conversion to Islam came from Christians and pagans that were in the land, um, as those people were colonized. Uh, it's a very interesting history when you read it. What's What's funny is I learned from a very early childhood, uh, and I was I was proudly told, and I was supposed to be proud of the fact that uh, that that um, that Islam that our Muslim conquerors. They, uh, you know, fought and they spread Islam. They conquered left and right and this and that. I was supposed to be proud of that. Uh, while at the same time, basically learning to hate the Christians who fought. And it, it it's, it's funny how... Uh, it's funny how weird human nature is, how it only dawned upon me very, very late in life. Wait a minute. 
wait a minute, why am I why am I exactly learning to vilify the the Christians who fight and the Crusaders when my whole life I'm learning to just be proud of the Muslim warriors who spread Islam to the world? It doesn't make sense. And then what's even better when you speak to the Dai in the park? Is that Islamic warriors? No, that war was spread by by the mouth. It was just to call the call to Islam, and everyone just wanted to to, to, to become Muslim. It's like really, there was no armies that marched from Medina to North Africa and then into Spain. That didn't happen. It was just it was just the Ali Dawa of the seventh century that was calling people to Islam. Yeah, I mean, I mean the entire Crusades, as much as you might might want to criticize the nature of them and uh, how they were conducted and all of that, were a response to uh, to repeated calls to do something about the expansion uh, from you know to, of, of Islam by by force, the the Islamic armies which are taking away the Holy Land, which are expanding and slowly approaching and coming toward Europe. There were calls after calls after calls until. The crusades were actually issued so <laughs> even that notorious historical event which people in the west like to bring up when we talk about religion was made in response to aggressive islamic ex expansion that's how islam spread but then i'd ask all the christians in the chat why did you all then kill the jews on your way there what did we have to do why are we catching everyone's strays <laughs> i recently talked about um the spanish uh Spanish Reconquista, which is um, when 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 the when the Spanish took uh, Spain back from the Muslims, um, drove them out, and made a few concessions at the end of the conflict. They finally reestablished the land. They kicked out the Muslim forces after centuries of Islamic rule, um, and finally agreed to take uh, Granada. Uh, under the conditions that they will not expel the Moorish, the Muslim population, that they will let them live and allow them to live there without discriminating against their against their beliefs, as long as there is no um, you know big religious force established on their behalf or anything like that. But the issue is, um, while they did agree to that, while they did agree not to do anything to the Muslims. I guess the sentiment here is uh, they thought, well, you know, we can't kick them out. What are we going to do? Let's take out the frustration on somebody else. Who is it going to be? The Jews. So, and then they asked the Jews, convert to Christianity, leave or die. Hello. It's probably it's probably the wrong audience to say this, but I would say during that period, the most Muslims were actually a bit better than the Jews than the Christians. Y'all weren't very nice to us. Yeah. Well, I, I, you could say you could say that the after the reconquest, the Spanish were probably worse because. Under the Muslim rule in Andalusia, there were pogroms like the uh, 1066 Granada pro uh, pro pogrom, for example, among others that were um, specifically targeted. They, they that specifically targeted Jews. But when the Spanish took over, they did not just do pogroms. They categorically said no Jews anymore allowed out now. So. <laughs> That was 1492. Um, but but one thing that needs to be said about the Muslim uh, Andalusia is something that was actually brought to my attention again recently by uh, Jay Apologetics, who is also here on, on, on YouTube and who uh, does some good work. He brought up something that, uh, that uh, Maimonides said in his uh, writings, in his epistle to Yemen, where he has some very, very harsh words about Muslims and Arabs and living among them. Do you... <laughs> One of my favorite debates I ever had, um, I was there moments from a debate, was Adnan Rashid um, bringing Maimonides as an example of how great it was living <laughs> under Islam. He was the physician to Salahuddin. Salahuddin, he was his physician. This is how great it was to be a Jew under Islam. And so I said, let me read from the epistle. Let me read from Igeri Iman. <laughs> and I started with it like, no nation has persecuted us more than the, than the Arabs. He's like, keep reading. This helps me. And so he kept reading. It gets worse and worse and worse. As Maimonides, um, the Rambam, describes the treatment of the Jews under the Al-Muhad. His, his family suffered. Like you, you have no idea how his family suffered. And so when confronted with all of this in, a, in another debate, 
And then Rashid turned around and said, well, Maimonides is a liar. Maimonides is a liar because he was the physician at Saladin. And so these guys cherry pick. And then Rashid now knows exactly what he said. I saw the video on your podcast. It was a recent video. Salah, um, Adnan Rashid brought up Maimonides as an example of how good it was to live under Islam. And Adnan Rashid is so familiar with this, this clip because I turned it into a short and I think a million people watched it or something. So Adnan knows exactly what he's doing. He's deceiving. They're all deceiving. No. And yet he, he he just published, yeah, as you just said, he just talked about it again and again brought Maimonides up as, a, as, as an example of how good it was, uh, which is just... This is just a blatant lie. And what's also funny is that Maimonides was in that letter addressing uh, Jews in Yemen who are complaining and who are being targeted by, by the ruling Muslims and who are afraid and asking Maimonides for advice. And he is saying living under these people has been worse than living under anybody. And so, but truthfully, that, that, this is the, the, the insanity of the Dai because there are examples you could bring who write similar things and they actually had a very cushy life because they lived during a good time. They didn't live under the al Muhads, They lived under someone else. Um, but yeah, um, thank God that we've got stupid enemies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That is a good point. Um, one thing I want to, oh yeah, one thing I actually want to, want to bring up is uh, you briefly mentioned uh, the leader of the Palestinian movement. Um, I recently brought this document out uh, and made a stream about it and also posted it um, on Twitter. But this is an official document taken from uh, documents on German foreign policy, which are recorded. This is a meeting that took place between Hitler, the Führer, and uh, the Palestinian leader, Amin al Husseini. So um, it says, yeah, here, rec record of the conversation between the Fuhrer and the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem on November 28th, 1941, in the presence of Reich Foreign Minister and uh, Minister Grubber in Berlin. Now, the Mufti goes to visit Hitler. He lives in, uh, in Germany at this point, is treated very well by the Nazis. He's an ally. And Hitler, makes certain promises to the Mufti. And among those promises here are, are these, which you can find directly. This is official. This is not made up. This is not a story. This is official record by the Germans. It says, the Fuhrer then made the following statement to the Mufti, enjoining him to lock it in the uttermost depths of his heart. He, the Fuhrer, would carry on the battle to the total destruction of the Judeo-Communist empire in Europe. At some moment, which was impossible to set exactly today, but which in any event was not distant, the German armies would, in the course of this struggle, reach the southern exit from, from Caucasia, which never happened. Three, as soon as this had happened, the Fuhrer would, on his own, give the Arab world the assurance that its hour of liberation had arrived. Germany's objective would then be solely the destruction of the Jewish element residing in the Arab sphere under the protection of British power. In that hour, the Mufti would be the most authoritative spokesman of the Arab world. It would then be his task to set off the Arab operations which he had secretly prepared. When that time had come, Germany could also be indifferent to French reaction to such a declaration. This is an official document. And of course, if you read the whole meeting here, there is some really harsh stuff said. Um, but this is an official document in which officially Hitler himself has a meeting with the primary leader of the major Arab Arab movement at the, of the time, the Arab Higher Committee. And he sits down with the Mufti and they collaborate in promising each other a future where they will take over and get rid of the Jews in Arab rule. So the entire idea that all of this just started with, you know, Israel being atrocious in 1947, 1948, and all of that, that's complete nonsense. This is 1941. This is uh, Amin al-Husseini, who prior to this already was uh, extremely anti-Jewish and wanted their, their extermination. This is him sitting down with Hitler, the notorious Hitler, and devising a plan. Make no mistake, Khadramin al-Husseini is the man who battle cry for the Ummah, for the Muslim world, was, O oh Muslim, Muslim, I declare a jihad. 
slaughter the Jews, slaughter them all. The, so, yeah, I, I think one thing is very, very easy to, to focus on these like pariahs. I think one thing that's very important for me to say, because I've kind of been dogging on Christians and dogging on Muslims a little bit in the chat. <laughs> um, and what I'd like to say is if you'd have spoke to my ancestors 600 years ago, 700 years ago in Europe, and told them that your closest friends in 700 years time are going to be the Christians. They would look at you like you were a lunatic because back then <laughs> Christians were literally ripping our flesh from our bodies and oppressing us in the most brutal ways. Yet today, I cannot think of a closer friend that the Jewish people have. Um, India's getting pretty close, so you guys have to um, <laughs> keep up. Uh, <laughs> but the, there's... The, I cannot think of a closer friend. The Christian community has done so much and stands consistently in solidarity with the Jewish people. And I yeah, think we're seeing something in the Muslim world which is comparable. So it's very hard at the moment to imagine a world where Jews and Muslims are best friends. But something's happening. There is normalization. And there are many, many Muslims that are speaking out and standing against the extremists. And I think those of us like yourself, like myself, that have a platform, we have a duty, an obligation to amplify those voices because any scripture can be taken to a dark place and can be taken to a good place. And there are 2 billion Muslims in the world and many of them take it to a good place. And they're the people I, I like to, to, to amplify and shine a spotlight on because I, I think it's a pretty dumb thing to pick a fight with 2 billion people. And so like, you should make friends and you should find allies and you should find friends in the different communities. And so I, I would like to say that I, I have tremendous respect, man, respect for, for Christians today who just approached me. Like last night I was having um, a drink with a friend and a Christian just walked up and said, whispered in my ear, you're not alone. He didn't have to do that. He was just saying, look, guy, I know you're having a hard time, but there's a lot of us that are with you. And so I, I think it's also really important to, to, to keep things positive and focus on both what happened with Jews and Christians and imagine that happening with, with Jews and Muslims in years to come. Um, and so I think there's an obligation on those of us in this space to, to make those bridges and amplify those voices. Yeah, two things that I saw recently, um, several things that I saw recently, which are quite positive, actually, uh, from Israel are, um, so first off, Israel has this consistent message of, uh, of, of basically saying that our fight is not with Islam. Um, is, uh, Hamas even goes against Islam and all of that. Now, I have my disagreements and my reservations about that, but of course, I, I understand where Israel is coming from. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, Israel also has a significantly large Muslim population, a 20% uh, Arab Muslim population, I believe. And um, since October 7, there were um, there has been a, a massive increase in how Arab Israelis feel more positive, more connected to Israel as a state and feel more Israeli. There was a survey which showed that 70% uh, of Arabs in Israel now say that they are part of Israel and its problems. Prior to that, it was like around 40% or something. So there's been a massive increase after the October 7 attack. So while Hamas intended to cause damage and to tear it down and to ask uh, Muslims all around the world and Arabs in Israel to also join, they did the opposite. They actually um, drew the Arabs within Israel closer to Israel and to the to, to Jews. We, there was recently a video where a, an Arab man describes in tears how he was, how his wife was with him in the car and she was killed by Hamas terrorists who were in very close range and could clearly see that she's a Muslim woman wearing a hijab. They didn't care. They just shot her and killed her. And he was there trying to protect her, hold her, and she died in his arms. And he says they don't care about anything. They don't care if we are Muslims or Christians or Jews or Arabs or whatever it is. They just they just kill. So, yeah. No, completely. There's so many stories of heroes, Bedouin, Muslim, Arab, Druze, that 
saved Jews. There was like a, I think a Muslim, certainly an Arab, I think a Muslim Arab, um, gas station attendant who rescued 14 Jews and hid them in, in the garage. There was um, Israeli IDF commanders who were wounded, saving Jews. There were Bedouin uh, um, tax, um, bus drivers who just kept on going back and rescuing more and more Jews. And then there were Hamas dogs butchering, know, knowing that they've got a, a Muslim, a Bedouin, an Arab, and slaughtering them. It did not make a difference. And so I think you've made raised a very important point. One thing we often, uh, the, as, as Jews, we often focus on is we call it achdut, the unity of the Jewish people. Before the 7th of October, we were a divided society. There was the, the, the Bibi must go camp, the Netanyahu must go camp, the Netanyahu is king camp. <laughs> they, they were clashing. There were big, big divisions. The Jewish people have never been more united. But more importantly, what you say is true, that Israeli people have never been more united. There's just incredible stories of um, uh, uh, Arab women cooking food for the IDF soldiers and taking it down, free, opening their businesses, not, not for Arabs, but for, for Jews. There is such incredible unity in Israel. Hamas don't realize what they've created. They have created more social cohesion amongst the people of Israel than there has ever been. Um, and I think that's the important message, an important message to publish um, today it is the unity, the unity between Jews and Christi Christians, the unity between Jews and Arabs, and the unity between all the citizens of Israel. 25% of Israel's population are not Jewish, and they have complete equality, and they have more rights than anywhere else in the Middle East, and they know this, and that's why there is this unity, that is why there is this gratitude. We are one people. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a very important point that you raised. I saw a video um, just yesterday when I was looking through um, videos, uncensored videos published on different platforms about the events. And uh, might appear quite trivial here, but uh, there was actually a video where um, Hamas is running through Israel and they're, they're attacking a, a little grocery store on their way. Um, first shooting at it then going inside and just taking whatever they can and, and getting out with it uh and and you have camera footage from inside and this the store is operated by uh a, a jew and an arab together they are in there they see this crowd coming they are alerted to it very quickly so they uh they they run to hide and they actually jump into a into the freezer that, it, that they have in the store and uh hide in the freezer which saves their life lives eventually um so they don't get seen they look for people can't find anybody steal a bunch of stuff and get out and leave but i don't know what's significant to me yeah uh final questions that i want to ask you um what do you think do both sides really actually want i know this is a very difficult question uh but I actually think it's not that difficult. <laughs> um, I think it's a very, I think the, the, the conflict in the history is complex. I think what both sides want is, is quite simple. I think Israel wants peace. And I think the Hamas want the destruction of Israel. I think it's a cliche and I hate to say it, but if the Israelis put down, or well, if the Arabs put down their weapons, there would be peace. If the Israelis put down their weapons, there would be no more Israel. I think it's that simple. There is nuance. There is um, Judea and Samaria. What do you do? There's the, like solutions are complicated. But what both sides want, Israel has offered the Palestinians everything you could imagine. I, I was at a talk with Ehud Olmert, and he told us that he offered them everything. He offered them East Jerusalem as the capital of their future Palestinian state. The old city would be shared under the custodianship of the um, Palestinians, the Saudis, the Jordanians, the Americans, and the Israelis. The, they would get basically all of the West Bank and all of Gaza. They would have literally everything that they wanted. <coughs> Abu said no. Sorry, Abu Mazen said no, just like Arafat before him. The reason they say no is because they want from the river to the sea. And until they abandon that that fantasy there will not be peace we need 
we need an Arab leadership that recognizes that Israel is here to stay and they will have to compromise. Mm -hmm. Tel Aviv is not going to be Palestine. It's not. Um, and the sooner that people realize that, the, the, the greater a chance we have for peace. I used to be a huge advocate for the two-state solution. October the 7th killed that. Even if you want a two-state solution, the savages that carried out the attack on the 7th October are not the people that are going to bring about that reality. They are not the government of a future Palestinian state. They are rapists, murderers, and savages. They practice a barbaric form of Islam, which belongs to the, 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 the pages of history. It should not exist in our era. Yet they practice it, and they bring it into the lives of anyone that they encounter. They oppress the Palestinians and they persecute and murder Jews. If you want a two-state solution, these are not the people that are going to bring that about. The Israelis, yes, they could. But Hamas, no. I don't know why you would say that, considering that this man has uh, just nothing but kind words, as you can hear now. <laughs> خمسة شيكل تشتري لك سكينة واضي مضيها وهنا على طول حزه خمسة شيكل خمسة شيكل إنك تذل دولة الكان لا تجدن أشد الناس عداوة للذين آمنوا اليهود والذين أشرف لقد أفسد اليهود لقد تغطرس اليهود وآن الآن حسابهم وآن الآن تدميرهم على أيديك How does it make you feel when um, you are aware that guys like these who are leaders at Hamas, together with their Hamas uh, soldiers here in the background, say these things and don't say Israel. They directly say, people of Jerusalem, we want you to cut off the heads of Jews. Their end has come. Kill Jews. Get a knife. Cut off their necks. Do it. How does it make you feel that this guy says these things, but then you have people outside who are like, Hamas are just, you know, it's just the resistance movement, bro. I feel privileged to live in a generation where the Jews fight back. There was a time when we couldn't. There was a time when we weren't able to. We know as Jews when to take genocidal threats seriously. And we know when to, to react to them. And today the Jew does not cower. We are not we need Jews. When they rise up and they tell us that they're going to murder us, that they're going to cut off our heads, we take those threats very seriously and we respond proportionately. And that is exactly what we're seeing today. We witnessed the biggest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. And our response has been to hit Hamas like they've never been hit before. Please God, we will return every last hostage and Hamas will no longer inflict the pain on their people or our people ever again. Halas. And so I think it's incredibly, incredibly important for the world to recognize that we will, we will fight back. You can, 500,000 of you can march on the street for these people. And it will mean nothing. It used to be that the Jew would beg the international community to protect us, to save us, to intervene when we were massacred. Today, the international community is begging us not to respond when they massacre us, but we will respond and we will keep our people safe. So yeah, I, I think most Jews, Today are responding. One of the most beautiful things, actually, end on this. I can't tell you how many Jews have come up to me and tell me that, you know what? I never used to wear a kippah, but now I wear a kippah when I'm out. I never used to light candles on a Friday night, but now we keep Jewish traditions. The best Jewish response to these savages is to be Jewish, to have Jewish families and to flourish. They tried to kill us and they didn't succeed. We have the blood of survivors ru rushing through our veins. We will win. We outsaw the Nazis, we outsaw the Romans, we outsaw the Babylonians, and we will outsee Hamas. 
I support that, and I hope that I put my hopes in that. Back to one oh oh from Israel made a super chat said, "Can you bring Israeli Jews to lots of love?" I can try. I can do that. Yes, yes. Apparently, you're not good enough, Yosef, because you're not from Israel. You're 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 not in Israel. So. Inshallah, <laughs> um, give me a few weeks now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. Um, one thing is, if you if you could say, if you could have one criticism of Israel, what would that be? In this conflict or throughout time? I guess in relevance to the conflict and in general. I know it's a hard question during a conflict. <laughs> I mean, the, the, truthfully, um, the, it's the obvious. The, the 7th of October should never have happened and it did happen the security fence was breached in 20 places and civilians babies chill uh, children women were slaughtered and kidnapped and for me that the biggest criticism was of the the security failure that allowed that to to happen and um, everything else is downstream of that and i think ultimately and this is a criticism of israeli politics over the last year um we have been a divided nation um, and we allowed hamas to lull us into a false sense of security we allowed hamas to to get to the position where they were able to inflict this truthfully um i was always a fan of the disengagement from gaza i now think the disengagement from gaza was a mistake um gaza i hope will look something like the West Bank, where you will have an Israeli presence, which will prevent Hamas from arming and inflicting this kind of pain, this kind of um, devastation on Israeli Jews, Muslims and Christians, Druze, everyone else that's living there. Um, I, I, I long for the day where there will be lasting peace, but I think the, the short term, what I would like to see Gaza under the control of Israel again so that it's Hamas or whomever is seeking to destroy us from there is never again in a position to inflict something like the 7th of October. It's kind of funny, it's kind of ironic that uh, my position would be considered uh, harsher and more extreme than yours in the situation but I mean I, I said since October 7th uh, when it comes to Gaza um, I said I I, I find it um, unfortunate that Israel did not just annex annex Gaza in the past. And I can think of no reason why they shouldn't do it. Of course, the one reason is that, uh, that they don't want to, that Israel sees how bad the situation is and that they would not want to have the population of Gaza as an actual integral part of Israel. But everything... And annexing it could have been justified a long time ago. And they didn't do it. The, Israel decided to just let it self-govern, which I don't know, makes you think that was probably a big surprise. That was probably a big a big a big um mistake and should have never been done. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I can. So I, I'm not sure about annexing because I, my, I have to follow my morality, and I believe every citizen citizen should have the same rights. And I would not like the overwhelming majority of Palestinian adults in Gaza support Islamic Jihad or Hamas, and I'm not that into living side by side with someone like that and giving them the same rights as me. So for me, that's, it doesn't work. Um, I, and I don't know, I, I think basically, Europe went through a denazification um, program after World War II. 
And I think the only solution is for the, the people of Gaza and truthfully the West Bank, um, the so-called moderates who just lynched two Palestinians, um, to go through a similar program. Um, there is genocidal hatred of the Jews um, amongst many um, people in Gaza, and it's a real problem. I will acknowledge this one super chat, which comes directly from Israel, from my... Uh employers at Mossad who instruct me to make positive videos for this. <laughs> uh, just a running gag here. But uh, thank you, Mir Mikhail Lankre said, uh, peace to the infidel prophet and my brother in the faith. We are strong in Israel and trust in God. Blessed be he. Humanity should be united against evil. God bless you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I believe Yosef does too. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Really, really helpful. One final thing I want you to ask. I know it's wartime and I, I know it's difficult. And thank you, Samantha Amaral, by the way. Uh, in contrast to the question about uh, one criticism of Israel, if there was one praise or one positive thing you could say about the Palestinian side and I don't want to discriminate here between Gaza and the West Bank. If there was one thing, what would that be? I'm so glad you said Palestinians and not Hamas. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I, would, not I wouldn't. I do wouldn't. Do that. I wouldn't. I would um, never do that. <laughs> I would never do that. They don't deserve any single acknowledgement, any single praise. They are messed up. But yeah, if it just if it's just Palestinians as a collective. So a positive thing or a positive attribute? Um, I guess it's, it's very difficult because we're in the middle of a, of a literal war with, with the government of Gaza. Um, I think what I can say is I'm not going to make it about Palestinians. I'm going to make it about the people I know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give some examples. Some of the most inspirational people I've encountered in my line of work have not been Jews, they've been Palestinians. I'm actually going to um, share the story of the one person who inspired me more than anyone else I, I've ever met. So I was doing a documentary for the BBC and part of that was they introduced me to a Palestinian and he shared his story and his story was as follows. He was 17 years old and he threw a hand grenade at an IDF soldier. The grenade didn't go off, so nobody died, but he was jailed for terrorism. While he was in jail, he started to research his enemy. He wanted to know what was motivating the, the Jews to be so evil. And he thought the first place he'd start was the big lie. And in his society, in his community, this is his words, not mine, the big lie was the Holocaust. And the more he read, the more he realized that his enemies had been to Jahannam and back. They'd been to hell and back. They were persecuted and they needed a home. And so when he was finally released from prison, he moved to the UK to do his master's or his doctorate, I can't remember which it was, on the Holocaust. So this is a man who was a terrorist who then went on to study and empathize with the, the Jewish people. He then returned to Quds. He returned to Jerusalem. He started a family. He had a sweet daughter and aged eight years old, an IDF soldier shot her in the back. She was killed. Nothing can amend for that. Nothing. The state compensated him. It was... It, there was no question of the wrongfulness of her, her killing. And for me, if I devoted my life to making peace with my enemy and my enemy had snatched my daughter from my arms, there'd be no return. This man then went on to devote his life for peace. And he and I were stood in a yeshiva, the, uh, like a madrasa, a religious seminary that overlooked the Temple Mount, Masjid Al-Aqsa. And he looked me in the eye and he said, Yusuf, 
Peace is going to come. We're not going to kill each other forever. You can either be part of the solution. You can bring about peace or you can be a barrier to it. And I've met many people like Bassam, many people. No one quite like him. He was phenomenal. But there are so many Palestinians who have raw wounds and they've chosen the path of peace. They put aside our religious differences and they, they seek to coexist with us. And I do everything I can to amplify those voices. And so I think that is a, a person or an example of the type of Palestinian um, or a, a positive aspect of Palestinian or the Palestinian people. Um, I've never been, I'm actually after this call, I'm going for a drink, an non-alcoholic drink with a Palestinian Salafi friend of mine. So it, it, it's um, they're very, very Salafi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not, not like Speaker's Corner Salafi, like the real deal. Um, yeah. And yeah, they were. Uh, so yeah, it's very hard to call because Palestinian society and culture is quite divided. But the most inspirational people I've met in this have actually been Palestinians like Bassam, the man I just spoke of. That was very powerful and very, very, very inspiring. I just hope for, I don't know, better times, more peace. Uh, I guess I heard something similar from a different angle. I recently re, uh, I, I, I re-listened to a book which I read a long time ago by uh, mm -hmm. Mossab Hassan Yusuf, who is um, who is a the, the son of a. Hamas co-founder and co-leader who is currently in prison. Um, I think he recently was arrested of uh, of Sheikh Hassan Youssef. Um, and he, as a young adult or teenager, young adult, he was um, taken in by Israel under suspicion of terrorism because he had purchased weapons, which also didn't work. And um, in prison he was questioned underwent some really hard questioning some really hard practices uh when he, he, he for, for a brief time for for a while he was still convinced that he was right but in prison he was exposed to how hamas treat their own kind how hamas treats uh p fellow palestinians how hamas treats other groups and how these groups just fight with each other over dominance, over power, over all kinds of things. How they kill their own people, imprison them, uh, make them lie uh, under torture. Like he witnessed things. Like he was hired there to to um, to record the confessions that these uh, supposed um, you know moles <laughs> suspected by Hamas give under duress, under torture. He was he was there to write those things down, and he witnesses by his account how um, Hamas, you know, authorities in there just target random people which whom they don't like, and accuse them of being collaborators with Israel, and then torture them and do things like uh, shoving needles into their fingers between their fingernails and their fingers, and uh, making them confess to very extremely absurd things that are there is no way they are true such as them confessing to having sexual interactions with their own family members uh and things like that to just to, to then say look this guy is a collaborator and we have all kinds of dirt on him and and they and they then uh blackmail those people by saying uh if you do anything wrong if you deny this if you you know do any of this stuff we will send all your statements to everybody you know in gaza and then you know your life is over. So, and this is how they treat their own people. And I don't know. After a long series of events, he uh, wakes up to the realities, starts understanding Israel and Jews, and he actually starts working for the Israeli uh, security agency Shimbet, where he then successfully helps in preventing lots of terrorist attacks. And by their words, is uh, responsible for. The survival of so many people who don't even know that they um, have their that they owe their lives to him, and he wrote extensively about the, 
the, the struggles. And I don't know, I was really so inspired by a, a, a personal account, by a book. Uh, there is hope in the world, I guess. No, there truly is. And I think he's one of the most inspirational people um, that have a public platform uh, in, in this space, the, um, the, the Israel-Palestine space. And I think there's many, many more unsung heroes like him. Israel has incredible, incredible intelligence agencies. But behind many of those informants are people of incredible conscious, conscience who see exactly who Hamas are. And they, they, they can be Muslim, they can be like, like um, the Green Prince, they can, they can vote to Islam, Christianity, but there are many, 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 many people who see Hamas for what they are. And hopefully, with what's going on today and what's going to happen tomorrow, many more of those people will finally be able to speak out. And we will see a, hopefully, please God, a peace movement emerge amongst the Palestinians, like we see amongst the Israelis. It's unthinkable today to imagine a Israeli flag um, waved by Palestinian peace activists in Khan Yunus or in Ramallah like you see Palestinian flags waved by Israeli Jews in Tel Aviv. But please, God, in the coming weeks, months, years, we will begin to see such a movement emerge as Palestinians are able to finally call out for peace. Inshallah. Uh, all right. Are those your final words? Anything else you want to say before we leave? Um, check me out. Israel Advocacy Movement. Like, follow, subscribe on all the usual socials. <laughs> definitely. I'm bad at plugging, but uh, definitely uh, you can find uh, Joseph or Yusuf on, um, on here on YouTube. Uh, his channel is called Israel Advocacy Movement. Also very active on Twitter dealing with the conflict and everything about it extensively. Uh, very helpful resource. So follow, check it out. And while you're here, leave a like and share this to spread the message. Hope for better times. And until next time, see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. See ya. Yes, I'm still trying to end my live stream, but for some reason it doesn't.